Hey everyone, and welcome to this video. Last time, we introduced you to the fundamentals of electric circuits, and we also discussed how sensors work. In this video, we're going to explain how you can power electric systems. To do this, we'll introduce you to some fundamentals of battery technologies, and we'll explain how you use your Arduino to power outputs and actuators. Let's get started. To get things started, let's talk about batteries. To put it simply, a battery is a technology that you use to provide power to an electrical system. Batteries come in a variety of different chemistries, sizes, and power capacities to fill the needs of different applications. For example, batteries can be small and relatively low power, like 1.5 volt AA and AAA batteries that you find in most common household items, like a TV remote or a wireless mouse. Alternatively, batteries can be fairly large and have higher power capacity, like those that you might find in an electric vehicle. Additionally, when you're designing batteries, you really need to consider at least two important characteristics. That is, the voltage of the battery and its energy capacity. The voltage of a battery refers to the average energy of the particles that come out of that battery. Whereas the energy capacity kind of relates to how long you can power an electric system. Energy capacity is measured by multiplying electric current times time. So its units are amps, hours, or in smaller circuits, milliamp hours. Now, as an engineer, it's important to know how to use these to design a particular battery system. For example, if you know the electric current flowing through your electric circuit, and you know how long you want the system to last, you can multiply those two things together to find the battery capacity that would be adequate for your system. Consider the following example. Let's say you were designing a lantern to provide light at a campsite from dusk to dawn. The lantern has an operating current of 500 milliamps and would need to stay lit for at least 12 hours. What would be the minimum allowable battery capacity to satisfy the needs of your design? Pause your video and take a second to calculate the answer. To solve this question, we simply multiply the current by the operating time to determine that we would need a battery with a capacity of at least 6,000 milliamp hours. Battery systems are usually comprised of smaller individual cells that are usually wired in either series or in parallel. When you wire two battery cells in series, what you'll see is that you increase the voltage while keeping the energy capacity of the system the same. If you were to wire those batteries in parallel on the other hand, you would see that the opposite is true. The voltage of the system would remain the same, but the energy capacity would increase. Now think to yourself, what are some common everyday examples of when you would see these battery architectures? Well, if you've ever changed the batteries in your TV remote, you would notice that the batteries go in in opposite directions. This tells you that those two batteries are wired in series, so as to increase the voltage of the system. Let's say you wanted to create a battery architecture to really increase the energy capacity of your system. You think, I'm just going to throw a bunch of batteries together in parallel. That'll get the job done. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work out quite so easily. Let's think of a really silly analogy. Let's say that I went out for a hike and I brought with me a banana. That way I had some extra energy to refuel along the way. If my hike was gonna be a little bit longer, maybe I would bring two bananas. Yum, I love bananas. But if I was gonna go for several weeks and turn my hike into an expedition, could I bring with me on my person several hundred bananas? No, that wouldn't work out at all. I would be totally over encumbered by bananas that I wouldn't even be able to hike anymore. This is an important concept known as the law of diminishing returns. For every unit of energy capacity I add, I will not receive the exact same equivalent return on lifetime. This is because for every battery I add to the system, I increase the weight of the system. And as a result, I need more energy to move the system in the first place. This is why every single battery I add to the system, or every banana I add, actually makes it almost harder for me to move, and I get a lower and lower return on the investment. This also has a lot to do with the energy density of a battery. Energy density is measured in terms of energy per unit volume or per unit of mass. Now, if you were an engineer and you were trying to design a cell phone, would you care more about energy per volume or energy per mass when selecting a battery for that system? Well, we know that cell phones need to be transportable and fit inside a person's pocket. So as an engineer, you might care more about energy per unit of volume so that you can make the cell phone small whereas you may not care that much about energy per unit of mass.
no discussion of batteries would be complete without talking about battery safety. There's a couple things you really need to be thinking about to keep yourself and your electrical system safe when working with batteries. First and foremost is to ensure that the voltage of your battery matches that of your output actuators. For example, if you had a 6 volt motor, you would want to make sure that you selected a battery with 6 volts as well. Due to Ohm's law, if you chose a 12 volt battery, you would actually increase the electrical current delivered to your device, which would probably damage it and cause an electrical fire. Another big no-no is to make sure that your battery leads do not touch for an extended period of time. If that were to happen, your battery would be discharging energy on itself, or effectively punching itself in the head to the point of it catching on fire or exploding. So that's not good. Another thing to be mindful of is choosing the voltage of your battery to suit your system. What I mean by this is because power is equal to current times voltage. If you want to deliver a high amount of electric power, it's probably better to choose a higher voltage battery so that you can limit dangerous current. The Tesla Model S, for example, has a 400 volt battery so that it can provide electric power with lower electric current. If you tried to power that same Tesla Model S with a 1.5 volt battery, you would need a lot of electric current and you would run a greater risk of causing electrical fires or dangerous shorts. Now that we've taken a look at how to power electric systems with batteries, let's take a look at how you can power your Arduino and use your Arduino to power other electric devices. Let's... Huh. I thought I left the Arduino sitting right here. Oh well. Anyway, you have about three options to power your Arduino. The first thing you can do is plug in a USB to the top USB port. Now this works fine, but if you've got any electrical issues, this could damage the USB port on your computer. So for larger, more sophisticated circuits with larger current draws, it's usually best to use one of these other options. You can also power your Arduino by plugging in a power supply to the V-in and ground pins. And lastly, you can also power your Arduino by plugging in an external battery into the black power port at the top using the barrel connector that we provided you. Now, the Arduino can accept a battery with a voltage of 6 volts to 20 volts safely. After you've got your Arduino all hooked up and ready to go with an adequate power source, you can use your Arduino to power the components of your electrical system. The first option you have is to supply constant power of either 5 volts or 3.3 volts using the 5V and 3.3V pins on your Arduino respectively. The other option you have is to provide variable power using the digital pins. Your Arduino has 16 digital pins that can provide a maximum of 5 volts of power at up to 40 milliamps of current. To use these digital pins to power different actuators in your electrical system, you have two primary options. One option you have is to use the Arduino coding interface to command the digital pins to output either high voltage, 5 volts, or low voltage, 0 volts. If you look more closely at the code, you'll see that you can do this using the digital write command to control a specific pin number. In this case, we are setting pin number 9 to output 5 volts for one second, and then 0 volts for another second. This turns the light on and off, causing it to blink. But what would we do if we wanted to dim the LED rather than have it be on or off? This is where a technique called pulse width modulation, or PWM, comes in. Although the Arduino cannot technically provide any voltages in between 0 volts and 5 volts, PWM allows you to mimic lower voltage outputs by turning the digital pin on and off again at a certain frequency using the analog write command. The analog write function accepts values ranging from 0 to 255 to create what is called a duty cycle. For example, a value of 127, or approximately 255 divided by 2 would create a 50% duty cycle and mimic a voltage output of 2.5 volts. If you look more closely at the code for this circuit, you can see that the light on the far right is being supplied with a value of 5 volts, given that we have an input of 255 or a 100% duty cycle into our function. The lights on the left are clearly dimmer than that on the right because we have set them to duty cycles of 4 and 20%. Not all digital pins can do PWM. On the Arduino Uno, the PWM pins are labeled with a squiggle sign. The PWM pins are 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, and 11. Now that you've learned a little bit about batteries and using your Arduino as a power supply, let's meet up with some student groups here on campus that use these concepts to build robots.
Hi, my name is James Koval. I'm a junior mechanical engineer here at the University of Maryland, and I'm also the mechanical lead and vice president for robotics at Maryland. We compete in a totally un autonomous underwater robotics competition every year in San Diego. Just like ENES 100, our robot uses a suite of sensors and actuators that are controlled by our computers. Um, we use our sensors, like our camera and our IMU, to control our actuators, like our thrusters and our pneumatic system. In order to power it all, we have a couple of batteries here that we do calculations for. It's also very important that the entire system is waterproof to prevent short circuits from the water leaking into our system. Overall, this competition is a massive challenge, but it's also really fun. If you're interested, please reach out to me, um, or you can go to our website and sign up for our newsletter at ram.umd.edu. Hey everyone, my name is Alec. I'm a senior mechanical engineering major, and I'm part of the Leatherbacks Club, which is another robotics club here on campus. We do battle bots, just like how you see on TV. And there are different weight classes, like this is the 12 pound class, and this one here, Professor Hex, is part of our 3 pound weight class. These robots use all the principles from ENES 100, and we use them to build and test. For example, we like to work in teams and leverage the engineering design process. We also use various manufacturing methods, like 3D printing, this back that holds the battery and all the electronics, CNC machining, the armor, and the weapon to hit other robots with, and also fastening it all together with nuts, bolts, and screws. We also use principles from electronics. This is particularly important for our battery. Because we have a weight limit, we have to optimize the battery for power, lifetime, and efficiency. And this helps us allocate more weight towards the armor and weapons so we can deal and take a better beating. We also have to carefully select the motor so that it's compatible with the battery like making sure that uh, they have the same voltage and current, otherwise it won't, be, it won't work. We also have to design the remote control to actually use the robot. All in all, we use a variety of engineering design principles to successfully integrate all these components into one menacing battle-ready robot. Well, there you have it, everyone. Now you've learned a little bit about the fundamentals of batteries and using your Arduino to power your electric circuits. From now on, you're going to start to work on your own projects, and... Huh. It's the emergency warning siren. But it's not the first Wednesday of the month. This just in. We have a national crisis unfolding on the National Mall, as a massive giant Arduino is wreaking devastation and havoc all across the Washington, D.C. area. I hope this works. Why don't you pick on someone your own side? Is that all you've got? <laughs>